So hi, everybody. Um, so this is interesting. I've never done this with a back projection. If I laser onto the back, can you see it? Yeah? yeah? OK. I guess we'll do it this way. Maybe I'll jump down in front. So, uh, so I'm Henry. Um, I'm a mathematician. I work at Oklahoma State University, which is a university in the United States. I'm also a mathematical artist. I mostly work in 3D printed um, sculpture. And I'm going to tell you some, well, how to make sculptures of four-dimensional things. So um, I guess before we start, um, what is four-dimensional space? Now, I don't mean, um, like, if I was a physicist, maybe I'd think of the fourth dimension as time, or um, there's various other ways that people like add a dimension to things. I'm talking about four spatial dimensions. So, well, what does this mean? So let's go back to two dimensions, right? So everybody's seen uh, how to draw a graph in high school. Um, you've got an x-axis and a y-axis, and you describe some point in space. Here we go. Let's try it. This is so cool. Except all of my text is backwards. It just makes it a bit tricky. So, so here's the point three, three along and two up, and I go three along and two up, and I follow the axis. OK, and then to do three-dimensional space, um, let's take, get rid of the numbers. Here we go. You just add an extra direction. Right? So I added an extra axis here um, at right angles to the other two, and then I can describe numbers, uh, describe points in that space with three numbers. So to describe four-dimensional things, all you need to do is add another axis that's at right angles to the previous three. And then you can describe a point in that space with four numbers, w, x, y, and z. And uh, maybe I will come, in, come down in front. So, you may be unhappy with me at this point, saying, what is this nonsense? You can't find another direction that's at right angles to the three you already started with. This picture is a lie. And you'd be correct. This is also a lie, right? This vector here, this, this arrow here, is not at right angles to the other two, right? This angle here is, I don't know, 60 degrees or something. On the screen, which is a two-dimensional thing, you're fine with me drawing this third direction and saying it's at right angles to the other two. Why are you fine with this? I don't know. It's because you grew up in a three-dimensional world and you're happy with this idea that this is some sort of picture of a three-dimensional thing, but it's not actually a three-dimensional thing. And in exactly the same way, you should be happy, maybe, with this being a picture of four dimensions. OK, so what's actually happening here, hello, there we go, is this is a sort of projection, a shadow of something in three dimensions. I've crushed three dimensions down to two, but we're OK with this picture because we understand three dimensional things. And in the same way, whoops, here I'm crushing a four dimensional thing down to two dimensions, and I'm just sort of drawing in these little things here to show that they're at right angles. OK, so from a mathematical point of view, four-dimensional space is just you have four numbers to describe points. You can still talk about lengths and angles and all of the things you usually talk about. It's just harder to see things because we're not evolved in a four-dimensional space and we don't really understand it. OK, so, so let's think of some example. What's an example thing that we can put in this four-dimensional space that we're going to try and understand, which we're going to try and see. So, so we're going to make something called a hypercube. Um, so we're going to start very simple with a point, and I'm going to move that point across, take a copy, and then connect up those two points, and I get a line segment. Everything great so far. Let's do it again. So here's a line segment. I take a copy, I move it across at right angles to the line that the line segment was in. And I connect up the corners, and I get a square. Then I do it again. I take a copy of this square. I move it at right angles to the plane that the square is in already. And I connect up the corners, and I get a cube. And I'm lying again already, right? This is not a cube. This is a flat thing on a two-dimensional screen. But we're happy with this. Fine, whatever. And then we're just going to do it again. Take a copy of the cube, move it at right angles to the three-dimensional space that the cube was already in connect up the corners, and that's some sort of picture of a hypercube. So, so this is maybe kind of useful, right? So, so you can tell some things from this picture. You can tell how many corners a hypercube has, right? You can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then there's another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 over here. So there are 16 corners on a hypercube. 
and you can count how many edges there are and so on. So you can get some sense of it, um, but it's not a great picture. So, so the first bit of this talk is how do we get a better picture of what this thing is? Okay. So how do you see four-dimensional things? Well, unfortunately, the answer is we, we can't really see four-dimensional things. There are people who claim that they can see, they can actually visualize truly four-dimensional objects. Um, I think they're wrong or misguided, um, but there are people who claim it. I don't know. The, there's all kinds of strange things going on in people's brains. Well, how do people actually try and understand four-dimensional things? Well, you use various tricks. And here's one of the tricks. So you use a shadow, or you project down. And this is what we were doing just before. Here's a, here's a cube. Um, it's actually a 3D printed cube. And it's sitting on a sheet of uh, transparent plastic. And I'm shining a light down from somewhere up here. And it's casting this shadow down on here. So what's the idea here? This is crushing a three-dimensional thing down to two dimensions. And soon we're going to do the same thing going from four dimensions down to three dimensions. So, so this thing here, um, if you had a two-dimensional friend who lived in the table, and your two-dimensional friend wanted to understand this strange three-dimensional thing called a cube, what you could do is cast a shadow down here, and then your friend would be able to interact with this shadow and would be able to touch it and say, OK, I can see this thing. I can see, oh, there's like there's an edge here and there's an edge here, and it looks like they're parallel, right? They're, they're going in the same direction. And you'd say, yeah, yeah, the real cube has maybe this is this edge up here and this edge over here. The real ed the real cube has these edges and they're parallel to each other. And your friend would also say, and this edge here crashes through that edge there, right? They they actually intersect each other. And you say, well, no, um, that doesn't really happen. That's just some sort of problem is an artifact with the way that we cast the shadow, right? Um, because what's happening, I think maybe it's this edge here is crossing over, the shadow is crossing over this edge here, and then you get them two crashing together. So this isn't perfect, but this is something. Okay, so this is something called a parallel projection of a cube, um, because the light rays come in parallel to each other. And this is a 3D print of a parallel projection of a hypercube. Um, I should mention this is, uh, this is by uh, Bathsheba Grossman. Bathsheba Grossman has really been one of the pioneers in 3D printed mathematical artwork. So I have this one here. So I'll hand a bunch of things around um, that hopefully will come back to me at the end of the talk. So I want to emphasize something here because this is kind of a little bit confusing. So this is a, what, well, what is this thing? This is supposed to be a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional thing. So back here, we had a two-dimensional shadow of a three-dimensional thing, right? When you cast a shadow, the dimension goes down one. And so in the same way, this is a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional thing. We can work out the math and uh, the maths and, and figure out where things go, and then we can 3D print the result. Hopefully that makes sense. So, okay, so what have we got? So this is, a, this is another parallel projection, which means that the light rays are coming in parallel to each other. So in this picture back here, um, my torch was very, very far away. Or if you use rays of light from the sun, they're coming to come in parallel. And the same thing here. There we go. Um, so again, you see, right, there's edges that look like they're parallel in three dimensions. And they're really parallel in four dimensions as well. That bit's accurate of this way of casting a shadow. But you get another sort of problem here. You don't get edges crashing into each other. But you see this edge here. It goes through this square here, rhombus, whatever. So you do get this edge sort of crashing into this face of this thing. So it's not great yet. OK, so what else can we do? Um, well, we can move the light um, closer to this object and get a different kind of shadow. So this is uh, called a perspective projection. And I haven't really improved things yet. Right? You can see I've still got this problem with the edges are crashing into each other. Um, and now I don't even have parallel edges, so this isn't so good. Um, there is something interesting, though, here. You notice that the shadow looks like a perspective drawing of the cube. Right? It looks like what you might draw um, what a cube looks like. And so why is that? It's sort of an interesting little aside here. So here's sort of a picture. Here's the light, and here's the cube, and here's the shadow. And if you sort of reverse the direction of the light rays, and instead of having a torch up here, you put your eye there, then what would you see 
of this cube. What you would see, well, this is what this little screen is here. This little screen is what you, you would see if you put your eye where the torch was. And so, of course, it's the same picture, right? You've just shifted the screen down from right in front of your face to on the table. So that's why you get the same picture. OK, um, back to this thing. How can we improve things? So here I've put the, the torch um, right above the uh, square face of the cube. And uh, maybe I'll actually do this, or I'll attempt to do this. Let's see if this works, because I don't really have enough hands. So, so this, this is a, a mini Maglite um, flashlight torch. And it has this nice feature that you can use it as a candle, like this, like the top comes off. But for my purposes, what's really good is the LED is exposed. It's a really small point light source. So maybe I can get this to work if I do this. There you go. So I've got this little point light source, and I can put the light right above the face of the cube, and I get that. OK. So, well, am I doing better? Yeah, because none of the edges are crashing into each other. Is there any crashing going on at all? Yes? No? Yeah, OK. Some people say yes. OK. Well, what's going wrong? So, where are the six faces of the cube? Right, the six squares. This thing down here, that's the bottom face of the cube. And then these four trapeziums, tra tra trapezoids, I never remember what they're called. Those four things around there, those are the sides of the cube. But then the top face is going over all of the other five. Right? So the top face of the cube, the light from that, the, the light that goes through there, goes over the other five. So we haven't sort of completely won yet, but we've removed edges, crashing with edges. OK, so if you do that one dimension up, you get this. This is another uh, sculpture by Bathsheba Grossman. Hand that around as well. And this is pretty good, right? So um, let's see, there's, there's eight cubes in a hypercube. So there are six square faces of a cube. There are four edges of a square. There are two ends of a line segment. So two, four, six, eight, it turns out. There's a pattern there. So there's one in the middle. That's the cube that's on the bottom of the hypercube. Then there are six arranged around it, these trapezium-y things. So one plus six, that's seven. And then there's one more. And that's this big one that covers all of the rest of them. So this is pretty good. We're, we're, we're not quite there, but this is pretty good. OK, so what can you do that's better? Well, for that, we're going to need something called stereographic projection. So, um, so I've got this black slide so that I can show you this with the, the shadows. So here's, here's a, a sphere, a spherical 3D printed thing. I'm going to put the, the microphone down for a second. So there is a trick I figured out how to do this one-handed. If I hold it like this, then, uh, yeah, so hidden inside of this sphere is this perfect grid. Anyway, hopefully that's clear to everybody. Um, it's not so easy to, uh, to, to do that. So here's a slide, <laughs> which is a much nicer, easier way to do this. Um, right, so, so what is this stereographic projection thing? So here I've got the flashlight, or sorry, the torch. I'm in England now. Um, and I've put it at the north pole of this sphere. And what happens is these light rays come down and they hit the sphere somewhere, maybe here. And then they carry on and they hit the table. And, there's, and this map, this function, goes from the sphere to the plane. And it's just that map. So it's just where does it hit on the sphere? Where does it hit on the plane? And so it maps this weird sort of curvy grid to this square grid here. Okay. So, so that's what stereographic projection is. Just before I move on, um, I thought I'd just comment. Um, so this photo was not so easy to take. I mean, you could, you could probably see I was sort of like lining it up and like my hand was shaking a little bit. And if you move the, the light just a tiny little bit, the shadow doesn't work anymore. So in fact, what's going on here, the hand is purely decorative. What's going on is that the, the torch is attached to a rod that's coming down from above. 
and there's a beam across the top and there's a couple of clamp stands and I just put my hand in there to look like I was holding it. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, okay, great. This is awesome. What does this do? It makes a three-dimensional thing two-dimensional. Great. Um, so how am I going to make a, a picture of a cube, right? Because I want to show my two-dimensional friend a cube using this thing. And, uh, well, and the problem with this is that this is a sphere. It's not a cube. So first of all, I have to get the cube onto the sphere. So this is, this is supposed to sort of illustrate this. So I got my torch now in the middle of a cube and it's projecting outwards to a sphere that's centered on the cube. This, this is sort of, um, I got a cube inside of a sphere, and then I just sort of blow it up like a, like a beach ball cube. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, so I do that, and then, then I 3D print that. It's all about 3D printing shadows. So, so here's that sort of beach ball cube, and then I do the same thing again, and now I've got another picture of this shadow of a cube. And this is my favorite way to cast a shadow of a cube into two dimensions. So, so, well, what's so good about this? I mean, sure, it looks kind of similar to the last one that we did. There's a square in the middle, there's four squares around it, there's squares, right? Um, the edges aren't even straight, but here's a really, really important thing. Where are the six squares? There's one at the bottom, there's four around the outside. Where's the sixth square? It's not the same problem as last time. It's outside, right? So, so here's, here's a light beam. It hits, it starts on the, on this square face, really, but just at the North Pole. And it goes along and it hits outside here and it hits over here. So the top face actually goes outside. So this is better. Um, and if you do the, so here's another view. And if you do the same thing to the hypercube, then you get this thing. So, so this is a little bit better, um, I would say. Um, and I'll go into more deep. I, yes, it's all curvy, which is a problem um, in some ways. But the fact that you, you don't have any crashing is really important. That will come up later. So um, let's see. Here's a, a render of the same thing, which shows the square faces as well. Um, unfortunately, 3D printing technology isn't there yet with being able to do like the edges and sort of transparent faces. When that does happen, that will be great. That will be awesome, but at the moment, it's not so great. Um, so here's a computer render instead. But you can see the cube in the middle, the uh, six cubes around it, and then we're actually inside of the eighth cube. Just like in the previous one, the top one goes outside, so it fills up the rest of the plane back here. Whoops. Come on, here we go. So the top face fills up the rest of the infinite plane, and here, whoops, too far. The, the top cube fills up the rest of space, and we're inside of it. OK, um, so that's stereographic projection. Um, let me just say a couple more things, because it's awesome. Um, there are these really pretty um, things you can do. So this is like a, this one here is a regular pattern on the plane and a weird pattern on the sphere, um, as is this one. This is a hexag hexagonal one. These ones are nice regular patterns on the sphere that give pretty regular patterns on the plane as well. I'll just mention uh, maybe one thing about this that's super cool. So you can see here that this, there's this sort of radiation symbol right on the front. And the shadow down here is also a radiation symbol. Um, and the angles are correct. So the lengths are all super distorted. But the angles here, these are 60 degree angles here. And they're also 60 degree angles here. Um, and that's true with, like, there's these, uh, I guess, tenth of a circle. So that's 30, 36 degree angles here. Same thing here. What, another cool thing is there's all of these circles here, which come from circles on. Anyway, I like stereographic projection. Carrying on, um, let's take a step back for a second. So when we made the, the hypercube, the sort of stereographic projection hypercube, I went by pretty quickly. What did I say? I said, do the same thing one dimension up, and you get that thing, which is now going around. So what does that mean? So hold on, let's just go back a few slides. So what did we do? First, we took the cube, going from three dimensions to two. We took the cube, we made a beach ball cube, and then we stereographically projected that. So a beach ball cube is a cube that sits on the sphere. So what did I do here? I take a hypercube, it's sitting there in four dimensions, and then I have to make a beach ball hypercube that's sitting on the sphere in four dimensions. So I'm going to try and explain to you what the sphere in four dimensions is, because it's kind of weird. So 
And again, the whole thing is like you go back down to down a dimension to try and understand it, and then you go back up again. So what is a sphere? A sphere is the set of points at some fixed distance from the center, right? So the ordinary sphere in three-dimensional space is the set of points which are equidistant from the center. Um, here it is. And so this, so we just saw with this uh, stereographic projection thing that this is the same as the whole two-dimensional plane down here. We're actually plus one point, right? So there's one point on the sphere that doesn't get hit by a shadow, and that's the very North Pole itself, right? You don't get the North Pole. Um, so you have to add one extra point up here that's sort of infinitely far away. Okay, so plane plus a point. Um, let me just mention while I'm here, so this is a different pattern here. I've got like an equator to this sphere, and I've got four triangles in the southern hemisphere, and I've got four triangles in the northern hemisphere, all right? And the shadows look quite different. There's these four sort of triangle things down here, and then there's these really stretched out things down here. And they look really different, but they're really the same thing. And if you're sort of feeling unhappy about this thing being the same thing as this thing, just look back over here, and then it's obvious that they're the same thing. Yeah? Okay. Okay, now we do it one dimension up, hopefully. There we go. So the four sphere in four-dimensional space is the same as all of three-dimensional space plus one point, which is the North Pole. So this is sort of the same picture of what the sphere in four-dimensional space is as this thing over here. So over here we had an equator. It was a circle. Here the equator is a sphere. Everything goes one, up one dimension. The southern hemisphere over here had four triangles. The southern hyperhemisphere over here has eight tetrahedra. Right? You can see there's a tetrahedron four-sided, a D4. Maybe that's better for this crowd. So I've got eight tetrahedra in the southern hyperhemisphere, and then there's another eight tetrahedra in the northern hyperhemisphere. And they look really different, but they're actually the same. They look different in the same way that this triangle and this triangle look different. This doesn't even look like a triangle. But it's a triangle, right? They're the same thing over here. So I can't show you, you know, the whole picture of where the light is because it's in four dimensions, but I can show you the shadow. Okay. So, right, moving on. So that's, that's the sphere in four dimensions. Let's talk about some other things that we can build in four dimensions and then see what they look like. So, um, so in two dimensions, we have the regular polygons, right? Triangle, square, pentagon, hexagon, and so on, and so on, and so on. And these really nice, regular, symmetrical things. Um, in three dimensions, these are the only regular, nice, symmetrical polyhedra, um, otherwise known as five of the six standard D&D dice. So you've got the D4 down here, which is the tetrahedron. Um, you've got the cube, uh, the six-sided uh, um, dice. And you have the octahedron, the D8 the dodecahedron, the D12, and the icosahedron, the D20. And that's it. There are no other sort of super symmetrical polyhedra in three dimensions, um, which is a little bit odd. There's infinitely many in two dimensions, but there's only five in three dimensions. Um, in fact, there are other infinite families. So we saw the, poly, the polygons, the two-dimensional ones, there's infinitely many of them. There are three other infinite sequences, but they all skip dimension. So we already saw this sequence in the middle before, right? Here's a point, and then a line segment, and then a square. This was the copy, make a copy across, connect up the edges. So point, line segment, square, cube, hypercube, and it goes on. There's a hyper, hypercube in five dimensions, and six dimensions, and so on and so on. You just keep doing the same thing. Then there are two other things you can do. So, so here's another sequence of these regular things, and this is a slightly different um, rule. It looks the same in zero and one dimension, but then it changes. What you do, is you, you have your thing, a line segment, you choose a new point that's a off the line segment, and you connect up the edges and you get a triangle. And you choose a new point that's not on the triangle, it's not on the plane that contains the triangle, and connect up the corners and you get a tetrahedron. And then this sequence also continues onwards. This is something called the five cell, and then there's something else in six dimensions, and so on and so on. And then there's one other thing you can do here, which is instead of making one extra point that's not on the thing you started with, you make two. So here is a line segment. I make two points, one up here, one down here. I connect up the corners, and I get a diamond, also known as a square. And then I do the same thing again. I choose a point up, up in front, and I choose a point behind, and I get an octahedron. 
and then there's something called the 16 cell, and this goes on and on. Okay, so four infinite families, the polygons, and then these three different ways of doing things, and then there are these five exceptions. These are the only exceptions to this rule. There's nothing else in any other dimension. So there's the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, which are weird. There's the 24 cell, which is this thing in uh, four dimensions, which is really bizarre. There's nothing like it in any other dimension at all. And then there are two other things. There's the 120 cell and the 600 cell, and these are both four-dimensional uh, polytopes. Um, and these pictures are just what we did before, right? You radially project onto the sphere in four-dimensional space, and then you stereograph stereographically project to three-dimensional space, and you see these pictures, whatever is going on here. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, well, first of all, we can 3D print these, or rather, half of it. So this is um, the half 120 cell, so I'll hand that around as well. Um, this is the bit that's in the southern hyperhemisphere, because if you printed the whole thing, it would be huge, and it would be really super expensive, and it wouldn't fit in my luggage. Um, so oh, I should mention, right, 120 cell, what is that, where does that name come from? So it's the same thing with the names of the polyhedra, right? So the dodecahedron, why is it called dodecahedron? So dodec means 12, and hedron means faces, so it's got 12 faces. Well, this is one dimension up. It has 120 things, has 120 cells. It's like a honeycomb. Um, so it's got 120 three-dimensional faces, which are called cells, um, and each one of them is a dodecahedron. And then the 600 cell has 600 tetrahedra. Anyway, so these things are kind of confusing. Um, so I wanted to try and understand this um, and 3D print some more stuff. So that's what we did. And I should say this is joint work with uh, one of my collaborators, Saul Schleimer, who's at the University of Warwick um, here in England. OK, so it's this super complicated thing. What the heck is going on? Um, it has 120 of these dodecahedral cells. You can see this sort of distorted thing out here. And, it, and there's a big one here. And again, we're standing inside of the one on top. It's got 720 pentagons sort of between those dodecahedral cells. It's got 1,200 edges and 600 vertices. So this is super complicated. Um, Let's try and sort of break it down. What is this thing? So one way to try and understand it is to look at sort of the layers of these, these cells going outwards. Um, so here's a picture. Um, so in the middle of that 3D print that's going around somewhere, there's a little small dodecahedron right in the middle. And I've drawn it here in red. And this is sort of a schematic picture of where it's sitting on the sphere in four-dimensional space. So here's the light at the top. And here at, at the South Pole is this thing here. OK. So then arranged around that central one are, 20, are 12 dodecahedra at, well, OK. It's at a distance, but distances on spheres you can measure with angles. So it's an, at a an distance quote slash angle of um, pi over 5 are these 12 ones here. There's a 20 of these at angle pi over 3 another 12 at 2 pi over 5, building these layers out from the South Pole. And we get to the equator, which, remember, is a sphere. And there's 30 dodecahedra there at pi over 2, so 90 degrees. Um, and if you sort of continue this pattern going further outwards, the, the pattern mirrors in the final four layers. So there's another layer of 12, and then 20, and then 12, and then 1. If you add all of these up, you get 120. Um, OK, great. Um, here's another way to understand where, how these dodecahedra are arranged. So what you can do is you can start in one of these dodecahedra that's in this three-dimensional surface of this four-dimensional thing. And you can say, OK, I'm going to go th out through one of the pentagonal faces of this thing. And then I'm in another dodecahedron. And I can just go straight through that to the opposite side and keep going. So I go through, go through this dodecahedron into this one and keep going and just keep walking through dodecahedra. And after 10 dodecahedra, I get back where I started, it turns out. If you start again in another dodecahedron next to this one and start going, then you, you again get back after 10. Um, and it sort of wraps, you make this second ring that kind of wraps around the first one. And there's a third ring, a fourth ring, and a fifth ring. 
So this gray ring that we started with, there are five rings. I've not drawn in the last one. There's sort of like a Death Star trench along here that you can fly down. Um, let's put it in there. So there's one, two, three, four, five rings arranged around the central one. So that's, each one had 10, so this is six in total. So six times 10, that's 60. This is half of the 120 cell. So this is half, and then there's the seventh, the eighth, come on, the eighth, the ninth, the 10th, the 11th ring, and as usual, we're inside of the last one. So the last ring goes down through a hole in the middle of this, and there's your 12 rings, 12 times 10 is 120. Okay. So um, we wanted to 3D print this, because that's what we do. Um, we wanted to 3D print, OK, not everything, because it would fill up the universe with plastic. But we wanted to do the ring around here, and then this, the, the five ones around it. Um, so there's a problem here, is because we wanted these things to be loose. You wanted to be able to take it apart and put them back together again. But when you put it in the 3D printer, your rings have to be separate from each other. If they're touching, then they'll just be stuck together when you're done. Um, so, so we had to sort of arrange them somehow. I could only actually manage to get two rings to surround this central one. I couldn't work out a way to, to put in um, a third one. Um, but we did that. Where is it? Here it is. And you get this kind of, uh, I don't know, kid's rattle toy with the, the, the central ring and then the two rings around that. I hand that around as well. Um, and so this is them fitting together, and they're slightly apart as well. There we go. Um, so, OK, that's great, but we really wanted to have all five of them. So, well, so what did we do? We cheated. So the problem, the problem with 3D printing the two rings that are linked is you have to print them in one. Um, you can't print them separately and put them together because they're linked together. So, well, maybe we can just get rid of these big four things on the outside that make it really expensive anyway. So let's just get rid of them. Um, and instead of a ring of 10 dodecahedra, we have a rib of uh, 6 dodecahedra. Um, and why do we call it a rib? Um, ice is gently curving, uh, and it's made out of dodecahedra. Um, anyway, um, so OK, so here's a rib. It's, it's 6 of the original ring. And then I can put in the other 5, right? This, the, this sort of what would be rings, except I've cut out the bits at the end. Let's get rid of the um, central ring, because we don't actually need it. And there's this sort of cool ring thing. Thanks. And here it is. Um, and uh, so, so we'd inadvertently made a puzzle. Because you print them separately, and then you have to fit them together. Um, so just to prove that this is really a puzzle. Let's take it apart. Um, OK, let me try and solve this live on stage. Somebody hold my mic for a second. So, it's like this. Thank you. Uh, I've done this many times before. If you break it, um, solve it. <laughs> or don't worry about it, because I can solve it. I've done it many times before. Um, let's see. So that is one puzzle. So we ended up with, um, let's see. So here's another way to, to cut it up into dodecahedra. So here's this sort of central straight rib, which we call a spine. And then you can wrap things around that. Whoops. Five. And then another five of these ones, and you get this um, symmetrical kind of dodecahedral thing made out of these uh, 11 pieces here. Um, and it turns out, um, let's see, so, so we sort of settle on like different ways to cut them up into, into these ribs, because you don't want them to get too big and go around the outside. Um, but with these six things, you can make this sort of bewildering array, array of stuff. Um, so here's a little puzzle for you right now. Uh, two of these are photographs of the same thing seen from different directions. Any guesses as to which two they might be? 
This is basically impossible. It's it, the last two. The last two. These two? No, sadly, no. Um, Top left, middle, right. Yeah, this has got a hole through the middle, whereas this one doesn't. Yeah, this is essentially impossible. I've had, I think, one person ever guess it right, and given how many times I've given this talk, that's probably statistically what you would expect. In fact, there are two pairs that are the same. Say again? That one and that one? That one and that one. Yeah, also wrong, sorry. Um, <laughs> This is the same as this, and this is the same as this. Um, so okay, um, so this. So I'll try and show you the, the second from the from the start one. There's this hexagonal whole thing, and if I just turn it like that, then there's the cross. So I mean, what's the moral of this? Um, the moral is that photographs are useless. And uh, I guess there won't be much time just after this, but I'm at the Maths Village, so you should come by at some point and check them out. Um, OK. So next project. Uh, so this was a joint work with Vi Hart, who you may have heard of from YouTube, and my brother, Will Segerman. Um, and this is um, a sculpture called More Fun Than a Hypercube of Monkeys. Um, and this is about four-dimensional symmetry. So, so before I get into the details of what on earth is going on here, um, I need to tell you about symmetry. So, so there's lots of different ways of thinking about symmetry. The sort of modern mathematical way to think about symmetry is that a symmetry is a way to move something, move an object, so that when you're done, it looks the same. Right? So here's this sort of symmetrical thing. And so I can move this so that it looks the same after I've done moving. Right? I can turn it. So there are five symmetries that this thing has. I can rotate by a fifth of a turn, let's say this way, or two-fifths of a turn, or three-fifths of a turn, or so on. And I'm also going to count the do-nothing. Like, there's a, there's, as, as often is the case in, in maths, there's usually like some trivial case where, yeah, OK, yeah, fine, you could do nothing. And that's also a thing that doesn't change it. OK. And, um, and this is sort of one of the ways into group theory, abstract algebra. Um, these symmetries, these things you can do, you can add them together by doing one movement and then another one. So like I could rotate by one fifth of a turn and then I could rotate by two fifths of a turn. And then doing those together is the same as rotating by three, three fifths of a turn. Try saying that five times quickly. Um, so anyway, you can add these things together and then you get groups and so on. Okay, whatever. Um, here's another example. So how many symmetries does this have? How many ways are there of moving this so that it looks the same afterwards. Four? Six? Eight? OK, so, so the answer is eight. So you can rotate it by one fifth, one, sorry, one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, or you also, also can't do nothing. And then there are four different axes of uh, reflection symmetry. OK. Um, so to describe what's going on with this monkey thing, um, I have to go and talk about monkey blocks. And uh, those of you who, who know of Vi Hart may see her influence here in the, um, in the picture here. So, so, so here's a, a cube that we've drawn things on top of. And here's the unfolded cube so you can see how it works. So, um, so there's uh, two tail faces on this cube. There's a, a question mark tail and a sort of unquestioned mark tail that goes the other way. There's a right paw and a left paw, the two paw faces. And then there are two face faces. This one, the tongue sticking out to the left, and this one, the tongue sticking out to the right. And they're sort of twisted somehow. So when you put it together, this thing has no symmetries at all, well, other than the do-nothing symmetry. There's nothing you can do to this that leaves it looking the same as it did when you started, other than just leave it the same thing. Um, and I'll just mention one other thing. So you see there's like a, a, paw, a right paw here, and there's a sort of like a, a sort of twisting motion to go from one side to the other. And that's the same on the other ones as well. This question mark here goes to a question mark here, and then the faces as well. OK. So how can you fit these things together so that the faces match up? And, when, and by match up, I mean that they should come together and be exactly the same. So like I would need a right paw to go to a left paw. 
OK. So here's one way you can fit them together. You can stack them together in a line like this. Right? So I've got a cube, and then right there, so there's another pore on the other side that is, so this, this one is like this, and the next one's going to be like this, which means it glues onto the one that's up there. And then it sort of goes along like this. Okay? So I can stack them together like this, and then I, and I can make an infinite line of blocks because I'm a mathematician and I don't have to practically produce an infinite number of blocks. I just have to say dot, dot, dot. But anyway, okay, so I've got an infinite number of blocks. What are the symmetries of this thing? What are the ways of moving this thing so that it looks the same when you're done? What could I do? I could shift it four along to the side, right? So this guy is the same as this guy. Yeah. Okay, I could do that. Is there anything else I can do? I, I could shift it backwards. Yes, yes. This is true. I can do some sort of rotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I'm after, right? So if I take this one up here and I go forward and rotate one click, do this sort of screw motion, then it's the same. Question mark becomes question mark and the, the paw becomes the paw, and the face becomes the face, and so on. So there's this sort of like screw motion symmetry of this thing. Um, so I don't really like this go forward by four things. So I'm going to get rid of it by just sort of curling them around into a circle of four of them. Also helpful because I don't have to make infinitely many blocks. And then I've still got this twisty thing, right? I can still go, go forward one and twist one, um, and that works. Um, so this one has only the, the twist thing, because I've sort of got rid of the go forward four by sort of wrapping it around. OK, um, I mean, this seems like cheating, but it will make sense in a second. What else can I do? Is there any, is there, can I, so I've made a line of these things. Can I sort of stack up and make a wall? Well, if you try doing this, you run into trouble. So, so here's the line of three of them across here. And if you put one on the top, then you get these two paws facing each other. And there's no block that goes in there, right? Because the pores on a, on a block are on opposite sides. I can't fit anything in there. Although it does look, I mean, this paw here and this paw here, if only I could close up those two faces, then they would fit together. But then I would need something with one, two, three cubes around this edge. And what has three cubes fitting around an edge? The hypercube has three cubes that fit around an edge. So. There's this cube in the middle, and there's one on the top, and then one on the side. And then you see there's three of them around this, this edge here. And so, in fact, you can glue these eight monkey blocks together to make the cells of a hypercube. The eight cells of a hypercube fit together. So you get this sort of decorated hypercube that has these things on it. Um, this is what it looks like sort of exploded. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are the symmetries of this thing? Um, I guess I didn't. I didn't put it down. But yeah, so the question is, what are the symmetries of this thing? So I mean, this is kind of drawn on here already. So there's this sort of twisting thing here, and there's a twist. Oh, well, anyway, um, it turns out that the same twisting thing going around here works again with these other, whoops, going the other direction, with these four going up vertically. And then there's two other directions where you can do this. Whoops. There's the one going through here, and there's the one going through here. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, it turns out that these um, symmetries, the symmetries of this decorated hypercube, um, correspond to the eight elements of something called the quaternion group. Um, if people have maybe done some computer graphics, you may have heard of quaternions, which are sort of fancier versions of complex numbers. Um, they are not quite as scary as they're made out to be. They're not that bad. Um, but anyway, so so. If you take the eight quaternions, one i, j, k, minus one, minus i, minus j, minus k, then these correspond to the eight different ways you can sort of move this thing around and leave it looking the same. So one is the do nothing symmetry. i, j, and k are these screw motions where you go forward and you twist. The negatives of those are the reverse screw motions. And then there's minus one, which sends every cube to its opposite cube. Um, and these satisfy the relations of the quaternion group. And so you get the quaternions out of this. Um, OK, great. Um, how do I make a sculpture which has this symmetry? So well, all I have to do is put something in each cell of the hypercube which has no symmetry. So, so the monkey block had no symmetry, and I ended up with something that had this weird eight-element group 
symmetry thing. And I should mention, by the way, whatever this group is, it doesn't exist in three dimensions at all. There's no object you can hold in your hand so that when you sort of rotate it around using ordinary three-dimensional stuff, you, you can do anything, so you, that you get that group. So as far as we know, this is the first time that anybody's sort of made a picture of something that has this kind of symmetry. And you had to go to four dimensions. Anyway, we're getting there. So, so the, block, the monkey block has no symmetry, and I want to put some design inside of this block of the um, hypercube. Um, OK, OK, it has the do-nothing symmetry. Everything has the do-nothing symmetry. But other than that, um, to make a sculpture with this symmetry type, you put something which has no symmetry inside of this cube. And there is only one choice. It has to be a monkey. I'm actually mostly serious there. So here's a monkey sitting inside of a cube. Um, and one of the big advantages of monkeys is that they have six limbs if you include the tail and the head, which means that you can connect this guy onto his neighbors in the other eight, sorry, the other seven cubes of the hypercube. Here's this guy, he's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six of his neighbors, and they all connect onto each other, and you need limbs to do that. Um, why are we doing something with limbs? Well, the thing itself can't have any symmetry. If I put something symmetrical inside of this cube, then the whole thing would have too much symmetry. There'd be extra symmetries there. So I don't want that. So if it's got to be something non-symmetrical, it might as well be a figurative thing. So I guess that means we're going to use a monkey. So there we go. Okay. So it's a monkey, and uh, we put his neighbors into all of the uh, other cubes, and then we do exactly the same thing as before, right? So when I was making this picture of a hypercube, what did I do? I started with the edges of a hypercube, I made a beach ball version of the hypercube, and then I stereographically projected to three-dimensional space. Now I have a design inside of each cell of the hypercube, and I make a beach ball version of that design by projecting it onto the sphere in four-dimensional space, and then I stereographically project that down to three-dimensional space, and I get this sculpture. Um, and there you go. So there's a web link here we'll get to in a second. We didn't stop there, right? We, so we've sort of done this with the hypercube, but there were other um, four-dimensional versions of the polyhedra there. So we can also do more fun than a 24 cell of monkeys, which has 24 monkeys. And we can also do more fun than 120, 120 cell monkeys. Again, this is only half of it because, again, it would be way too expensive. Let's go check out what this website is about. So this is an animated version. So if you go to monkeys.hypernom.com, this is web, web VR. So if you have an Oculus Rift headset, or probably a Vive, you can see this inglorious four-dimensional stereo vision. Um, so the, the controls are not documented, but WASD, as you might imagine, and some other things to do with the arrow keys. OK, so let's see what's going on here. So, so this is showing that symmetry. Right, so every few seconds, these uh, lighter colored monkeys are rotating around, and this one becomes this one, and there's this sort of twisting motion, and everything is doing exactly the right thing. Um, maybe if I look upwards, you can see that there's actually monkeys that go around infinity. So there's sort of a monkey god that sort of gets smeared out around everything. Um, There we go. OK. Um, let's see. So here's uh, more fun than a 24 cell of monkeys. Same sort of thing. This time you get a ring of six. Uh, you get rings of six monkeys. So the six lighter colored monkeys that are twisting around. Uh, you may be aware that the 24 cell is self dual. What that means, well, um, what it means is I can fit another 24 monkeys around the first. So there's the first one. And then there's another set of 24 monkeys that fit in between those ones. And let's go all the way to the 120 cell of monkeys. There we go. This is sort of monkey cosmology. Um, again, there's, um, this time there's rings of 10 monkeys going around here. Um, if you're going to do this at home, you just press the number keys to switch between the different kinds of symmetries and the different number of monkeys. OK. Uh, oh, and. That ring of 10 monkeys is exactly the same as the rings of 10 dodecahedra in the puzzle from before, of course. Um, OK. So I'm almost done. I've got a couple of things to say. So I have a book coming out. 
Um, it's called Visualizing Mathematics with 3D Printing, um, available soon. Um, I'll just mention one cool thing about this. So, um, so the book has all these figures, and the figures are photographs of 3D printed things. And you can go to the website, 3dprintmath.com, and you can download the 3D files. You can print them on your own printer. You can rotate them around on screen. You can order them from Shapeways. Um, why does the biology textbook not come with a 3D printed model of DNA or the shape of the heart? Right? If you're going to represent 3D content, why are you using photographs? Like 3D print something. Um, OK. There's um, a few things. There's one other thing that I wanted to show you, which is another app, um, which is on an iPad. So it will take me a second to switch over. So talk amongst yourselves. Whoops. I see. Is this working? Do I have? Do we have input? No? Not yet? It's not on the. Shall I unplug and replug? Try it. Let me unplug it and replug it and see if that makes a difference. I didn't warn them that I was going to do this, so. <laughs> I'll try unplugging and replugging. Oh, something's happening. No? Let me try unplugging and replugging. Otherwise, I'll just hold it up so you can see what's going on. OK, it's plugged in. No? This usually works. OK, well, I'll just hold this up so you can see it. No? Nothing? OK. All right. So this is an iPad app or Android, or again, um, if you prefer, you can use a VR headset. Um, uh, and as I say, this and the, the Monkeys app was uh, joint work with Vihart and uh, Andrea Hawksley and Mark Ten Bosch. So what is going on here? So you can see as I move the iPad around, there's dodecahedra sort of wandering around. These are the same dodecahedras all along. These are the dodecahedra of the 120 cell. But you can see that I'm interacting with this by moving the iPad. If you want to go to, um, so if you go to hypernom.com on your smartphone or otherwise gyroscopically enhanced device, then you can check this out for yourself. It's just, it's not a download, it's just actually on the website. Um, so what's happening here is that we're navigating through the 120 cell by moving the iPad. So um, this is a little hard to um, comprehend. Roughly speaking, what's happening is the set of possible orientations of the iPad is some three-dimensional space, right? I can sort of roll, or I can yaw, or I can tilt up and down. So there's three, three dimensions of ways you can move this thing. And um, it turns out that that space is very closely related to the sphere in four-dimensional space, which is also a three-dimensional thing. And so you can use one to navigate the other. So that's what's going on here. Let me just, uh, oh, wow. This is... Uh, unusual. Let me just try re, re here we go. That's better. Okay, so, so as I twist this thing to the right, you can see that I'm sort of going forwards. And when I get close to these dodecahedra, I eat them. So this is why the name is hypernom. This is hyper as in hypersphere and nom as in nom nom nom. Um, so this is four-dimensional Pac-Man. Um, the aim of the game is to eat all of the cells of the 120 cell. And you do this by getting the iPad into every orientation possible. In fact, twice, because there's a double cover going on. Um, so maybe I'll just finish by uh, giving you this image. Um, this is originally developed for Oculus Rift. So you have to imagine not doing this, but it being strapped to your face. And so instead, you have to do this kind of thing. And you try and eat all the cells of the 120 cell. And it's timed as well. So if you want to compete on getting very sick from motion sickness as quickly as possible, you can do that as well. Okay, uh, I think I'm probably out of time, so thank you very much.